<laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure for us to have today as a guest lecturer for our class of Law and Business in China, Professor Li Yuan, who is a professor of Chinese law and director of the Erasmus China Law Center at the Erasmus School of Law. Professor Li Yuan is involved as me and Angela in this uh, in European project, which is called EU Plant, uh, judicial and legal cooperation between uh, EU and China. And uh, today's lecture will be on the topic of uh, FDI legal framework. Uh, and Professor Li will explain us the new developments on China's foreign investment legal regime. So please, Professor Li, the, fl the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, everyone. Could you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. OK, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure today to give you a brief uh, uh, presentation about the new development in China's foreign investment law. Many of you uh, probably already know in March 2019, China's National People's Congress promulgated a new foreign investment law, which has become effective on 1st January 2020. While this new law has unified the previous uh, different laws and regulation into now a unified foreign investment law, which include many new breakthroughs and uh, which are, can be very interesting for not only for foreign uh, business people involved in China, but also for students to have a general understanding of the uh, new development in this area. So today, my topic is about the foreign, uh, 2019 foreign investment law. I hope after my brief presentation, we could also have time to discuss uh, some issues if you are uh, you would like to raise questions. My lecture will cover five topics. First, I would like to give you a very brief overview of the FDI, Foreign Direct Investment Landscape in China. Afterwards, I will tell you something about the background of making this 2019 foreign investment law, which is called FIL. Afterwards, we will discuss a few key uh, issues in this 2019 FIL, uh, which really represent the new development of Chinese foreign investment legal regime. Afterwards, I will give you a brief but a critical analysis of this new piece of law. Of course, we will end with a conclusion. Well, for the general land scope of Chinese uh, foreign investment law, uh, let me have a look who are investing in China. I have here, you can see from my slide, the top 15 global and EU investors in China by the end of 2019. You can see here uh, among the top 15 uh, global and EU investors, uh, the total number of foreign invested enterprise in China is a little bit more than 1 million. And among the countries, Hong Kong, has the largest foreign investor, uh, investors in China. They account total almost uh, yeah, 50%. Here is 47.4% of all the foreign investors in China. But of course, then you can raise the question, Hong Kong is a part of China. Why we put Hong Kong in, this, uh, as, uh, in the catalog as a foreign investor? This is, uh, uh, we have to go back to the Chinese uh, uh, foreign investment legal regime from the 1979, 
when the first foreign investment law was made in China, Hong, uh, for investors from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, they have been always considered as foreign investor. But of course, another question is, uh, nowadays we always see China is the largest uh, recipient of FDI. But if you include Hong Kong, it is. But if you exclude Hong Kong, the picture can be different, right? And from this uh, top 15, you can also see uh, for European uh, country, the first one is the Germany has invested uh, about 10,834 10, foreign invested enterprises in China. And they, their share of the total enterprise of F, uh, FIE is about 1.1%, uh, so it's rather small. After Germany, you see the UK, United Kingdom, uh, has about 10,040 foreign invested enterprise in China, and they account exactly here, 1% of the total number of FIEs. Afterwards, it's the Netherlands and France. I'm sorry, from this picture, we cannot find Italy. Maybe if some of you now, uh, but I think uh, also, Italy is not among the top 15, but at least uh, from the European member, uh, the, from the member state of the EU, Italy also ranks quite high. So this is about the total FIEs in China and from which country they come from. And next one I will show you. This is about the total volume increase of FDF uh, inflow to China. You can see China's open door policy. Uh, uh, open door means open to foreign investor for foreign investment started from 1979. At that time, it was a very uh, it's a really very minimum level of foreign investment in China. And the picture gradually changed. And nowadays, I, what I have here is till 2019. You see, they have reached 140 billion US dollars. So you see the change. And from this figure, later on, you will also, I will tell you about the foreign invest, um, investment legal regime uh, in different period. From, it's also can, uh, the legal development is also corresponding with the growth of this uh, 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 actual volume of uh, FDI. Because it's very interesting, like uh, from 1979 to 1991, you see it's all relatively small. But then from 1992 to 2001, it really grows deadly. And then after 2001, that's after China joined the WTO, it increased uh, all the time. Only in 2009, because you know the Asian uh, the, the, the financial crisis, uh, so it's a little bit low. But then from 2010, it go up again. So this also re uh, uh, the total FDI inflow to China really also reflect the change of the liberalization of the Chinese foreign investment uh, legal regime over the past 40 years. And what type, what types of uh, uh, foreign business they can establish in China? Uh, here from this figure, you can see that the largest percentage is 58.58%, nearly 60% is about wholly foreign owned enterprise. So it's uh, totally uh, owned by foreign business and now Chinese partners. And after that, you have uh, Sino foreign equity joint ventures. They account about 35%. 
and then is the Sino foreign contract joint venture. These different types of entities in China, they are all foreign, we call them together, you know, called foreign invested enterprises, FIEs. But this picture after the 2020 uh, changed a lot because the unified foreign investment law uh, became effective which at the same uh, at the same time the law for equity joint venture contracted joint venture and wholly foreign owned enterprises were abolished so all these different types of FIEs nowadays will be transformed into a, a companies under the company law so but they have given five years. So from after from 2020 to 2025, you may still see a company in China is referred to as a wholly foreign owned enterprise or an equity joint venture. But after 2025, they will be like the same as Chinese company, either called limited liability company. Or contract uh, our company limited by shares or partnership uh, enterprise. So we are now at the time of experiencing this uh, uh, change. Now let's briefly come to the background of the background of the Chinese uh, foreign investment legal regime. Here I would like to mention five. Uh, feature, uh, background I refer to five aspects. One is about the uh, dual track system. That's it's very typical in China. Uh, it means that Chinese law are made uh, in a way they have a set of laws for foreign uh, investors, foreign investment, then another set of law for domestic Chinese enterprises. I will explain you later this. Then another typical feature of Chinese law you need to know is about Chinese um, uh, uh, legal framework. It's always a combination of incentives and the control on foreign investment. This reflected in the previous laws, but also the new foreign investment law. Third issue I would like to touch upon is that if you look at the uh, past 40 years, the Chinese foreign investment law have uh, uh, developed in five stages. I will give you a very brief introduction about in each stage, what are the typical uh, laws or events representing that uh, period. And then we come to the, in 2015, actually, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, MoveCon, issued a, a draft of foreign investment law, which is a very uh, interesting in the uh, investment law uh, making process because it contains 170 articles, very detailed draft of foreign investment law. If you look at the current one, it only has uh, 42 articles. So it's a very simplified version of the 2015 draft of foreign investment law. And then when we talk about the new foreign investment law, we have to, it was uh, enacted in March 2019 in the middle of the uh, China-US trade war. Uh, I think in the process of, uh, during this trade war, China also feel, felt the need and the advantage of issuing a new law uh, to meet some of the U.S. demand and demonstrate China's willingness to liberalize its foreign investment market. So the U.S.-China trade war has a direct uh, uh, impact on the issue of the new uh, foreign investment law. Now. These are the background. Now let's go to the 
concrete issues. This is a reflection of the dual track system in general. Uh, it's a very, I just list, you know, in the top line, you have foreign invested enterprises and name uh, listed a few landmark laws relating to the FIEs. And then at the bottom line, refer to the domestic enterprises. And again, there I also only listed a few uh, very important laws just to give you an uh, idea that how these foreign uh, laws related, relating to the foreign invested enterprises and the domestic enterprise, they are really the law, a very different law applied to them. And you can see already in 1979, China enacted the first equity joint venture law. And then followed that, wholly foreign owned enterprise law and contract joint venture law were made in 1986 and 1988. These are the three fundamental uh, foreign investment laws in China, which have worked from the end of 1970s until uh, the end of uh, 2019. So they are very important uh, 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 piece of legislation in Chinese uh, legal framework for foreign invested enterprises. If you look at the bottom line, only in 1993, China uh, promulgated the company law. So it's much later than the uh, joint venture law for, for, for FIEs. But now, after the new uh, 2019 foreign investment law, that uh, this first three uh, joint venture and wholly foreign owned law will be abolished. And then for the corporate governance, they will uh, all change into uh, move, uh, either the existing one will change into the uh, uh, corporate governance uh, uh, as in the company provided in the company law and for any newly established uh, company uh, FIEs yeah, after 2020 and they have to follow the corporate structure in the company law. So this you don't need to of course remember all these uh, uh, pieces of law but just let me mention the important one in 1995, China introduced a catalog uh, to catalog of industries uh, in, for guiding the foreign investment. So in this catalog, it's provide what are what uh, what were prohibited in China, what were restricted, and what are uh, uh, encouraged uh, industry sectors for foreign investment in China. And then from 1995, uh, uh, we go uh, in 2003, it's also very important China introduced the first uh, interim provisions on the merge and acquisition. You know, before that, uh, before 2000, most of the foreign investment in China uh, took the form of uh, greenfield investment. So foreign investors uh, bring capital or technology or whatever other input, and then they set up a, a, a company in China. Uh, so that's a kind of a green, a green uh, field investment. But from 2000, gradually there are more and more uh, foreign investors. They would like to take over Chinese companies. So merge and acquisition occurred. Uh, but in a very small uh, scale. That's why in 2003, China only introduced uh, interim provisions uh, of uh, MA. Uh, and MA has now also for nearly 20 years in China, the history, uh, but still it has not uh, expanded as expected uh, uh, the there are, the, it, the MA market is not very active in China. And then we come to the 2015, uh, the MOFCOM introduced a very important draft law 
But then you see from 2015 to 2019, the, there was not much discussion about this draft piece. Only suddenly, uh, in the in the in 2019, after two times a review, uh, the National People's Congress uh, immediately promulgated the new foreign investment law. So this the uh, top line, you can see the key uh, landmark important legal instrument for foreign investment. Uh, let, let me briefly tell you a little bit about the incentives and the control of uh, foreign investment. This is a typical uh, feature of Chinese law. Uh, incentives, uh, I would like to mention too, why is the exclusive provincial treatment only enjoyed uh, for foreign investor and foreign investment? For example, this is typical in the tax law field. Uh, foreign investor investment, they enjoy lower income tax and also tax reduction and exemption. Uh, but these have been gradually uh, narrowed down. Later I will show you, uh, but still, they still exist in at the regional level. And of course, uh, also the foreign investment enjoy the lower land use right fees. So if you invest in China, of course, you all need to uh, get lessons to use the land. But for foreign investors, uh, that's often the case that they get a lower uh, fee. And another incentive China use a lot, which is also quite uh, successful, and I think could be really uh, interesting for many uh, to know, is the regional favorable treatment policies. Here, I mean the uh, special economic zone, SEZs. SEZ is a very uh, started from 1980s uh, in Shenzhen, in south of China, four first four cities in south of China, and then later on it also expanded to more cities. And then in recent years, uh, from 2013, uh, another new type of uh, free trade zones, FTZs, started in Shanghai and then also expanded to other uh, uh, cities, uh, areas in China. And then another region of uh, F, uh, both FEZs and FTZs are quite successful so far. Uh, another special uh, regional favorable treatment, uh, which is not really very known or successful, is called the Western Region Development. Western Region refer to the west north, and the north west of China. So the uh, policy is if you invest in that uh, region, uh, you will get all kind of uh, preferential uh, treatment. But uh, despite this uh, favorable policy, in reality, its uh, foreign investment in this region are not very successful. And then come to the control. China have used all kinds of measures to control foreign investment. Here I would mention uh, uh, three of them. Why is about what types of foreign investment you you can uh, set up in China? Here I, again, I refer to the uh, FIEs, uh, equity joint venture, contract joint venture, and wholly foreign owned enterprises. So you are not allowed to you uh, at least according to the law before the 2019 uh, foreign investment law became effective. Uh, most of the uh, foreign investment take this kind of uh, forms. And then another control is China use the catalog in industries guiding foreign investment. This is a very important when foreign invest for any foreign investor. If you before you go to China, you have to understand, you have to get all the information whether 
the investment you want to make is allowed in China. It's not everything is allowed. You know, when this catalog was first introduced in 1995, it provided, it had a long list of prohibited, prohibited sector, industry sectors, and also a very long list of restricted sectors. But over the years, it had uh, uh, prohibited and restricted sector have been narrowed down. And in 2017, the catalog was uh, 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 stopped because China introduced a new system st uh, started as uh, in 2017 as an experiment that we will come back later. It's called a pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list. Because of the neg negative list, there's no need anymore to use this uh, catalog. So that's why the uh, catalog does not uh, exist anymore. Then another uh, control measure that in China, it has been very strict, but also very controversial, uh, but also quite uh, yeah, function well in China is the case by case approval. So this means every foreign investment project need to be needed to be uh, approved by different level of Chinese authorities. If it's a huge project in the important industry sectors and you need the approvement of a ministry level, and then for some smaller project, uh, provincial level or even lower than provincial level uh, approval, uh, are required. But in any case, you always need the approval of the different level of the authority. So that's the case by case approval. It's not like in many, most of the Western countries, we have a kind of a simple registration system. If you want, for example, if a Chinese company want to invest in the Netherlands, then they, well, they do not have uh, Greenfield uh, investments, not uh, too many, usually take the form of MA. Uh, uh, but if they want to set up a trade, a trade office, for example, our um, small business uh, in the Netherlands, you do not really need the government to approve. You just need to follow the registration uh, procedure as domestic uh, 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 companies. But this was not the case before 2020 in China. But 2020 from last year, the case by case uh, approval system uh, was uh, have been abolished. But still, for certain kind of foreign investment, you still need approval. We will come to that uh, later. So this is basically uh, you will see that the Chinese foreign investment is always used this different instrument on the one hand to promote, give incentives to foreign investment, on another hand to uh, 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 impose all kinds of measures to uh, supervise or control the foreign investment. Now let's uh, let me briefly tell you about the. If you look at the past 40 years, oh, that uh, the Chinese foreign investment has uh, followed uh, can be uh, divided into five uh, period. The first is the initial period from 79 to 91. Uh, uh, follow that is the very rapid development from 1992. To 2000, and then we had the third period uh, is the after the WTO uh, till 2012, uh, uh, and then we enter into the new phase period is from the 2013 to 2019, with the end with the 
uh, promulgation of the new foreign investment law. And of course, from 2020, we enter into the post fail period. Let me briefly uh, tell you in which, uh, in every period, what are the uh, interesting uh, things happened you need to, uh, to understand a little bit. For the initial period, of course, you know, China in 1978, China formally introduced the new open door and economic policy. China's open up is uh, actually that's also this is uh, marked the start of modernization in China. And this process really uh, have given a lot of priority to attract foreign investment. That's why in 1979, the first Sino foreign equity joint venture law was, uh, was introduced. This law is among one of the few pieces of the new law with, together with the criminal law, uh, uh, for example. It's really the first group of law introduced in China after the Cultural Revolution. That also means the uh, starting time of the China's rule of law building. Uh, of course, the equity joint venture also it's not the most you need to have a Chinese partner. So, uh, and sometimes it's not always convenient for foreign investors if they, they, are, they were afraid that their technology could be uh, easily, uh, you know, uh, uh, took away or learned or stolen. By, by the Chinese partners. So th there was not always convenient uh, to, for foreign invest, uh, investor to have a joint equity joint venture. That's why in 1986, China uh, allowed for wholly foreign owned enterprise. Uh, so, but wholly foreign owned uh, law provide uh, also uh, the, the structure, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, principles about establishment, about the operation of wholly foreign owned enterprises. Uh, the advantage for this type of enterprise is you don't need to have a Chinese partner. But on the other hand, uh, it's not all kind of uh, foreign business can set up wholly foreign owned enterprises. For example, at that time, uh, if you want to invest in the uh, Manufacturing, most many manufacturing were, uh, sector, for example, making a uh, car, you had to take a joint venture form. You could not have a wholly foreign owned enterprise. Uh, actually, this only the first uh, really for wholly foreign owned enterprise making automobile cars, that's the Tesla. Huh? That's only happened in very recent years. Uh, so, uh, you could have a wholly foreign owned enterprise, but not all in all kind of business. Then, in 1988, China also introduced a Sino foreign contract joint venture law. Contract joint venture law also have the advantage, uh, it's more uh, flexible. Yeah, you, you, you set up an entity according to the contract. Uh, not, so this is more uh, uh, welcomed by for some foreign investment if they don't want to have an uh, equity joint venture or wholly foreign owned contract to provide them the easy uh, form to cooperate with Chinese partners uh, and to manage their business. In any way, this is three basic law uh, constitute the fundamental legal framework for Chinese uh, legal regime on foreign investment. And it has existed until 2019 foreign investment law became effective. Then in this period, uh, the, the typical feature of these three pieces of law is about case by case approval. It doesn't matter you are equity joint venture, contract joint venture of uh, W, uh, wholly for owned enterprise, uh, enterprise, you all need to be approved. 
that's the case by case approval. And another typical feature of this period is the dual track system uh, was very uh, obvious. It's nearly in all field of major field of uh, business law. They have a set of laws for foreign investment and another set for uh, domestic uh, companies, for example, in the case of contract. Can you imagine the first uh, contract law in China uh, were made was in 1981. It's called economic contract law, which only applied to domestic uh, uh, business entities. And then in 1985, China introduced foreign related economic contract law. So this is for con this is a contract law relating uh, uh, apply to uh, entities with foreign element. And then only in 1999, these two contract law were emerged into a unified contract law. And in the, for the dual track uh, feature, also very clear, it was on the tax law I have mentioned before. Re it relates to the income tax uh, and also the uh, uh, not only enterprise income tax, also for personal income tax uh, and for the enterprise. Uh, uh, so it make a, a domestic enterprise or FIEs, huh? the tax law matters a lot, of course. So in the China, in that in this period, it was completely separated. And of course, for this period, uh, it was also very important is China started with a special economic zone. In 1988, in Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, Xiamen, then in 1988, started also in Hainan Island. So this is the first period. Now let's see. Uh, from the second period, second period is uh, before we start to now what are the changes. Uh, it's interesting to mention that in 1989, there was uh, uh, something, there was a Tiananmen June event happened in China, student demonstration, then China Chinese authority at that time uh, uh, cracked down the uh, demonstration. There was uh, quite some uh, uh, um, voice from Western countries uh, uh, challenged China at that time uh, uh, for, uh, for this event. This also affected the foreign investment. So from the earlier uh, the table I showed you, there was uh, also a kind of, uh, mm, mm, you do not see the sharp increase of foreign investment uh, anymore from 89 uh, onward. Uh, and then in order to change the situation, uh, the Chinese uh, leadership at that time, uh, Deng Xiaoping, made a southern tour in 1992 he visited a few cities in south of China and then issued a very important uh, document uh, clearly uh, uh, point out that China should go to the socialist market economy. Uh, yes, what is the socialist market economy? It is really a combination of Chinese and uh, China at that time as a socialist country and market economy, of course, is considered as a Western uh, uh, regime. So China want to combine it. Uh, there is a famous fa uh, saying from Deng Xiaoping, is that no matter white or black cat, those catch mess are the good ones. So this is re this reflect uh, the uh, uh, ideology uh, victory of Deng Xiaoping at that time, that China should uh, continue with open door and with reform, with, uh, uh, which, uh, with the implication that China should learn from Western countries. As far as they can help China, it doesn't matter from Western or from uh, uh, Chinese traditional or whatever, but 
that the, uh, China is uh, very pragmatic in in the policy, and this have uh, also uh, considerable impact on foreign investment law. So during this period, the three basic foreign re uh, related investment law were all uh, revised, and then the contract law were unified, and to provide foreign investors uh, more clear instruction what they could invest it and what they could not. And China, for the first time in 1995, issued the catalog of industries guiding foreign investment. So in this catalog, it provides clearly what three catalogs are, prohibited, restricted, and encouraged. Those sectors were not mentioned in this catalog are uh, considered as permitted. So this catalog are also very important for foreign investor, investor and foreign investment to before they enter into Chinese market, they have to, of course, first know whether uh, they are allowed to do. And then, so that was the second period for China was a, a very uh, rapid development, was a very good uh, time. Uh, and then this also resulted in China's successful uh, access to the WTO in 2001. And actually China's uh, up, uh, effort to become a member of the WTO uh, has uh, encountered all kinds of uh, um, barriers. Uh, from 1986, China started to uh, negotiate with GATT, want to become a member of the GATT. And then later on, GATT become the WTO, the, con the negotiation continued. And it took uh, quite some uh, decade, huh? from 1986 uh, to 2001. In the end of 2001, China become, became a member of the WTO. And uh, when China joined the WTO, China made all kind of uh, promises yeah, uh, to change their foreign investment and trade policy, especially to open Chinese market. So because of these promises, uh, after immediately after the, the joining the WTO, China revised the joint venture law uh, and wholly foreign owned as well. And in this uh, law, uh, China abolished uh, the uh, export performance requirement because this is really the WTO commitment uh, and also uh, abolished uh, the uh, reporting requirement on joint ventures uh, production and operation uh, plan. And another significant uh, change is uh, about the uh, deletion of the local content requirement. So this means uh, before the foreign invested uh, enterprises, uh, they were required if they, for production, for example, if they need uh, some material materials, they first had to uh, purchase these materials in China. So this is called a uh, local contents requirement. But because of the WTO commitment, China abolished all these uh, uh, rules. And also another significant uh, revision is uh, relating to the foreign exchange. Because foreign exchange China has, and also today, is still very much controlled by the central government. But they have gradually uh, relaxed the, the rules, but it's still uh, it's con uh, controlled. It's uh, uh, for foreign invested enterprises, and the foreign uh, investors, uh, it's not easy uh, and uh, so free as uh, in the Western world that you can send your uh, profit uh, cross country easily. In China, you need approval. And then in 2007, uh, China also introduced uh, a unified uh, enterprise income tax law. So for foreign invested enterprise and Chinese enterprise, they pay the same enterprise income, uh, income tax law. 
And also in the same year, the anti-monopoly law uh, were introduced and it applied to both domestic foreign invested enterprises. So you can see after the joining of the WTO, this period also started a change of uh, uh, the dual track, system, dual track system and more and more important laws uh, applied to foreign invested enterprise and domestic enterprise uh, were unified. Now, another significant uh, development in this period is uh, in 2003, China introduced the first uh, provisional uh, regulation on the MA merge and acquisition of domestic uh, enterprises by foreign investors. These uh, provisions uh, have been revised in 2006 uh, six and 2009. And until today, even we have the 20, uh, 2019, a uh, new foreign investment law, but for uh, regulation on MA is still uh, not yet uh, uh, abolished. So this is the uh, post WTO period. Then the fourth uh, period, now we come to a uh, more recent uh, transitional period from 2013 to 2019. Why I see we start 2013, start a new period. This is mainly uh, because of the, in the context, in the context of China-US bilateral investment treaty negotiation in 2017, China uh, promised to make a change in its foreign regulatory, foreign investment regulatory regime by introducing the pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list approach. I will explain to you, this is, uh, sounds a little bit complicated, but I will explain it, uh, later what it's about. Uh, so that's why I feel uh, I would prefer uh, 2013 when China introduced this system as the start of a new period for foreign investment. So immediately after uh, China uh, made the, this uh, promise to the United States. Uh, in 2003, uh, same year, uh, uh, China launched the, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone. The Free Trade Zone is an uh, uh, upgraded uh, uh, concept of the Special Economic Zone. It's even it's, uh, open more to uh, foreigners, for example, uh, in Shanghai, they opened the service sector, financial, cultural, education. These were all prohibited or uh, restricted under the catalog, but were all really opened from 2013. And then also uh, in Shanghai, they started experiment by abolish the case by case approval and then introduce a recordation system. So the foreign investor, investor, if you want to invest in Shanghai uh, Free Trade Zone, you only need to register with the uh, local authority. There's simple uh, uh, registration procedure. And then also uh, in Shanghai uh, Free Trade Zone, they introduced uh, the free, the pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list. This is the first time uh, they access this uh, new uh, system. And also in Shanghai, they allowed uh, in this free trade zone, they allow for the free convertible uh, of the foreign uh, capital. Uh, so if the currency, foreign currency uh, exchange became uh, easier. So, Alan, the liberalization go further. Uh, it's also affected the draft in 2015 made by the MOFCON on the foreign investment law. If you want to go to some in-depth study about the foreign investment law in China, I would like you to pay more attention to this 2015 draft FIL because it contains a lot of details and reflect the trend of the uh, FIL. Mm. Uh, 
it is a document worth of more detailed study. Uh, in this uh, period, uh, again, they have revised the three foreign uh, investors, uh, the equity joint venture, contract joint venture, uh, and the wholly farm owned enterprise law were all uh, uh, revised and, of course, to adapt it to the new system which relate to abolish of the case by case approval and the record uh, for the after you enter into the Chinese market, you will ju just have a simple registration. So this is the most recent period. But uh, unfortunately, this period ended up with a very uh, uh, difficult uh, event. That's the US-China trade war. Yeah. 2000, uh, uh, the after Trump uh, administration introduced a set of measures against uh, China for Chinese enterprises, and then China also retaliated with uh, their measures. So they raised the tariffs and uh, investigated some uh, enterprises. Uh, so the trade war has really uh, made the whole uh, foreign investment uh, regime also uh, suffered uh, a lot. But in the middle of this trade war, China also, in order to uh, show its willingness to make a compromise, uh, to meet the demand, some of the demand of the United States, China introduced, actually speed up the legislative uh, procedure and uh, promulgated uh, in March 2019 the new unified foreign investment law. So actually the, the U.S. The U.S.-China trade war has a direct impact on this 2000 FIL. Why I say direct impact? Because this you can see from the major changes in this FIL relating to market access. Uh, in the new law, it's clearly introduced the pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list. This was first raised by the United States. Yeah? United States in its uh, trade agreement with others uh, countries have introduced this system of negative list. So this is the direct impact of the trade war. Another direct impact I would like to mention <clears throat> relating to the provisions on the protection of intellectual property rights in the new foreign investment law, especially on the <clears throat> especially on the article refer to the Chinese uh, government should not impose any measures on foreign uh, investment for forced transfer technology, forced TOT. This number one and number two are exactly the demand by the United States, of course, also by uh, EU uh, that China should change in its, uh, in its uh, foreign investment legal framework. And then, apart from this, in the 2019 FIL, another three aspects I would like to mention. One is relating to the information reporting system, system basically what a foreign investor, foreign investment they should report. Uh, I will go to the detail later. Another system is the national security review of foreign investment. Uh, we will also briefly discuss that later. And of course, there are some uh, new uh, provisions relating to the protection of foreign investment and also relate to the investment administration. Now let's discuss a little bit what is 
all this aspect uh, about pre-establishment national treatment with a negative list. This is the most this is the most uh, in, important breakthrough of the foreign investment law. As I told you, it was first uh, introduced, uh, used, apply, uh, first uh, mentioned by the Chinese uh, government in negotiation with the uh, US-China uh, bilateral investment treaty, and then accessed in Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and now finally it's provided in the foreign investment law. What that means? It means foreign investors and their investment are uh, accorded treatment no less favorable than that accorded to domestic investors in the market entry phase. Except that if investment to be made is in the negative list for foreign investment, either prohibited or restricted with additional conditions. So in the simple words, it means that foreign investors and foreign investment, they will have, they will enjoy national treatment when they want to invest in China in the market entry uh, stage. But with the exception, that's the negative list. If the industry sectors, if investment conditions were provided in the negative list, and then the firm, there's no additional treatment. They have to go through, they, they still need approval from Chinese authorities. So it's just as simple as that. And then, of course, the introduce of this new approach also means the abolishment of the case-by-case -case approval in the market entry stage. I hope you understand this change. If not, you can, I can give further explanation later if you have question. So this is a significant change. Uh, because now foreign invest investors, uh, they could easily uh, enter Chinese market. Uh, and then Chinese governments, of course, still want to have a kind of uh, yeah, control on them. How in the new foreign investment law, actually, they have elaborated that provide more details about uh, information reporting system. In the, this important uh, regime into, uh, include two aspects. One is about registration. The registri registration will go through the so-called online enterprise registration system. In the past, it was managed, uh, this uh, registration system was managed by state administration of industry and commerce, like the Chamber of Commerce in Western countries. But now this organization is called State and Administration of Market Regulation. And this registration process is uh, digitalized. Uh, so you just have to you you just need to provide all the document online. A more complicated system of the reporting is about the use the system of the national enterprise credit information publicity system. This means that the foreign investor, foreign invested enterprise, they need to submit annual report. And they, this applies to both domestic and foreign uh, enterprises. Let me give you some details. What this 
and uh, uh, report include what need to be included in this uh, report. For example, when you uh, register, uh, register uh, in your company in China, you need to submit initial report. Initial report, of course, is setting up your company, what kind of information you need to give. Uh, and then if you want to, uh, your company uh, changed either the uh, capital change or the, the uh, business uh, scope has been expanded, whatever, then you need to submit a modification report. And of course, if you wanted to stop your company, you also need to deregister your uh, company online. So then you need to submit a deregistration report. So this registration report is relatively uh, not so controversial. But for the annual report, annual report is a little bit, uh, uh, have generated quite some discussion. Because according to the law now, what needed to be uh, covered in the annual report, it's re uh, included the basic information of the FIEs, information of investors and their actual controllers. So information of investors and also who are the actual controllers of your enterprise. This scope can be broad, can also be narrow. So it is quite uh, unclear what need to be uh, provided. And another requirement about this annual report is the information on business operation. Information on business operation is also such an open-ended uh, concept. Huh? Uh, it may also involve some uh, commercial uh, information that FIE would not like to make it public. So reporting system is now an issue, has generated a lot of uh, academic discussion, but also is a real practical concern of FIEs in China. Another system introduced in the FIL is called the National Security Review of Foreign Investment. But FIL is very uh, brief on this issue. Only Article 35 provides the state shall establish National Security Review of Foreign Investment that impacts or may impact national security. Of course, such one simple article is not forcible in practice without a further detailed uh, provisions. And that's why in December 2000, MoveCom Ministry of Commerce and the China National Development and the Reform Commission adopted the measures for the National Security Review of Foreign Investment. This is a very comprehensive uh, reg uh, document which provides both the substantive rules and the procedural uh, details on how this security review or process work. This uh, national security review uh, uh, legislation is comparable with the EU with the EU regulation on screening of FDI. Uh, uh, this is also relatively new uh, in the EU about sc the screening system. Both China and the uh, EU, oh, I made a mistake, here should not be US, here should be the EU. So both China and the EU have adopted the US approach on 
screening the foreign investment. Actually, this national security review of foreign investment already started in China in 2011. First, State Council issued a notice, then Ministry of Commerce uh, issued a provision, very, very well known about the provision of uh, implementation of the security review system for merge and acquisitions of domestic enterprises by foreign investors in China. But we, I must mention, although this uh, system were already introduced in 2011, it has been hardly used in practice. You could hardly find the cases that foreign investment, foreign investor has to go through this uh, process and their investment were denied. This hardly happened in practice, but there, there were one case which scholarly analysis refer it as a kind of actual national security review, but it was not, uh, the procedure was not used as provided in this provisions. And recently, there is also one case, uh, it's, uh, but the case was a little bit uh, uh, not a typical because it's, it's a supermarket merge uh, with a take over another su supermarket. So it's not really, uh, it's very difficult to draw this case uh, that should be considered as a national security review case. But the, the national security review argument was used indeed. Now let's we look at the investment protection, what are really very special in this 2019 FIL. Uh, one I would like to mention <clears throat> is this uh, not here first? First, it's about <clears throat> no expropriation. Well, expropriation is a classical topic in any foreign investment legal regime. And in Article <clears throat> 20 of I FIL, It made it very clear the state explore, explore no foreign investment. Only under specific circumstances, state may expropriate or request, request investment of foreign investors, but it has to be in the public interest according to the provisions of law. And moreover, the expropriation and requisition shall be conducted under legal procedures and fair and reasonable compensation shall be paid, shall be made in a timely manner. So there are five conditions here. If expropriation happen, now what kind of conditions it must uh, be met? This is for, for the first time China have in Chinese law has provided this uh, rather international standards for uh, expropriation and compensation. How this will be uh, implemented is a big issue. We still need in the coming years to observe the practice. Uh, another aspect of investment protection uh, is about foreign exchange. This is very uh, uh, practical for any foreign investment in China. If you make a profit, if you make money in China, can you transfer your profit, transfer your money either in RMB or foreign exchange abroad? Yeah, it is a, it's a big issue. And the 2000 19 FIL um, only mentioned briefly 
a foreign investor may, it's may, it's not shall, huh? may, according to the law, freely remit into or uh, out of China in RMB or foreign exchange, its contributions made, profit, capital gains, and, and so on and so on. So, at least it is a promise in this for, new foreign investment law that foreign investors are allowed to freely transfer of their uh, money. But how this will be implemented, again, is a bigger, uh, big issue. Another typical uh, progress we can mention about the, uh, in the investment protection is about the IPR, uh, intellectual property rights protection and enforced transfer technology. This is very often related eh, by foreign commentators. Uh, Article 22 of the FIL state that the China, uh, the China state protect intellectual property rights of foreign invested enterprises and foreign investors. Uh, their their lawful right and interest uh, relating to, uh, also to the owner of IPRs and IPR uh, right relevant right holders and if uh, for the infringement and those uh, they will be uh, hold for st strictly legal liability. So this is the Alan Mall, also very important. It's mentioned in this article that uh, state encourage tech, uh, technology in, uh, cooperation and technology cooperation conditions are determined freely and equally between parties between chinese parties and foreign investment foreign investors and then this is very important administrative agencies and their employees cannot force transfer technology by administrative means. So this is a quite a, a, a clear statement uh, in the law, which have never appeared before. So this is now often, uh, often referred to uh, as a Chinese foreign investment law is against a forced transfer technology. The other uh, investment uh, protection words of mission is relating to the Article 24 that uh, require all level of local government cannot make local regulations which reduce the legislative rights and interests of FIEs. So, because in China you have the central level lawmaking and local level lawmaking. So, sometimes it happened. Uh, the uh, the right and in, uh, the foreign investment invested enterprise uh, the rights they enjoy according to the national law have been watered down by the local regulations so that's why article 24 is very important uh, to clearly uh, state that local government you can provide yeah, more better uh, uh, regulations which uh, better protect or give uh, more favorable uh, uh, to rules to the foreign investor enterprise, but not you cannot reduce their rights and interests according to the national law. Then another uh, protection which can be mentioned is the, uh, the new foreign investment law introduced a compliant uh, system. So that's in case a FIE or foreign investor uh, think their legis legitimate rights 
have been infringed by the local administrative agency, uh, or if they have a general complaint or suggestions uh, about the business environment, they can go to the relevant uh, authority at the local and also at the central level to complain. And last year, the MOFCOM set up a, a center, that's the national level uh, complaint center to hear, to receive a foreign investors uh, if they would like to make any uh, recommendation or complaint about the uh, policies relating to the national level, but for and the provincial, provincial level, but be, below that level, they could also go to the local uh, uh, corresponding uh, agencies. So this is about the major uh, investment protection. And now we come to the five-year transition. That's from the uh, 2020. The foreign FIL became effective uh, the, for the existing foreign invested enterprise like joint ventures or wholly foreign-owned enterprise. Uh, they have been operated for many years in China and now introduce a new law so they cannot uh, change into uh, to the uh, uh, corporate uh, structures required uh, immediately. So the foreign investment law have given them five years. Uh, so during the period from 2020 to 2025, uh, the existing FIEs uh, will change their corporate structure according to the company law or the partnership law. So this is uh, uh, also very important for, we just mentioned in the earlier, there are about 100, uh, 1 million, yeah, there are about 1 million FIEs in China. Now let me quickly give you a critical exercise. Now I explain to you all these uh, new, uh, new changes. new features of the uh, FIL, mm. but I think for the for uh, analysis, we have to first realize uh, this foreign investment law only has uh, 42 articles. It is a fundamental law uh, that uh, uh, it's a very uh, difficult journey for from the law on paper to law in practice. So to implement this law in China, it may take quite some time. Uh, another, as far as the content is concerned, I think uh, you can be very, uh, uh, need to, people need to be very cautious about the market access. Yeah. On the one hand, it has introduced uh, the better system for pre-establishment national treatment with market uh, with uh, negative list. On another hand, it's because of neg negative list, there are also all kind of uh, 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 approval still exist. Uh, so that's the system is not just uh, simply. Uh, uh, change the E2 a kind of uh, free market access as what uh, you probably uh, used in Western countries. So there, from the market entrance uh, point of view, there's not yet uh, uh, a really uh, same as Western countries. So there's a lack of reciprocity is still there. For example, according to the Article 40 of the foreign investment law, uh, for sectors like in banking, securities, insurance, and other financial in industries, uh, there are still separate laws and regulations apply. Then another critical aspect is about MA. Yeah, uh, 
the the FIL 2019 FIL is very uh, is very brief about uh, MA. It's only mentioned in the definition of foreign investment. It includes a foreign investor acquiring shares, equities, property rights, and uh, any uh, other uh, similar rights of a domestic company. But for MA, there are still separate regulations and still a valid in China. And of course, for the market uh, exit, uh, entrance and also post establishment stage, uh, the tr uh, equal treatment of uh, foreign FIEs and Chinese enterprises, uh, we also face a challenge about uh, what is the, how uh, is the relationship with SOEs, uh, state-owned enterprises? Is it realistic to think in China that FIEs can be treated uh, equally as SOEs? I think there are a lot of questions can be raised. And the same uh, implementation problem also can uh, refer to the national security review system and also protection of intellectual property rights uh, and the transfer technology issue. I think for the IPR issue and transfer technology, one cannot uh, expect that foreign investment law can offer better solution than other law like patent law, copyright law, and trademark law and their implementation. A last point I would like to mention that uh, the implementation of foreign investment law is really involved so many uh, agencies in China at different layers, and they also all need to study this law thoroughly and then uh, adopt, it, adopt them into practice. So it's need uh, some time. Uh, and then, of course, one need to be keep in mind is that uh, under Article 40 of the Foreign Investment Law, uh, it provides if a country or a region adopt any prohibitive, restrictive, or other similar discriminatory measures, so any discriminatory measure against China in terms of investment, China may adopt corresponding measures against those countries and region according to the actual situation circumstances. So this raises a question about the any possible change. Yeah, if a foreign country like the United States, if a region like the EU, if they adopt any discriminative discriminative uh, measures against China of investment and China may well enact similar uh, measures as a kind of retaliation. So this make the implementation uh, of the foreign FIL uh, quite uh, bring some uncertainty and some concerns. And moreover, if you look at what happened since because of uh, yeah we, last year because of COVID-19, yeah, uh, and then both the, the, the global investment landscape has changed a lot. Of course, there were uh, less investment last year and then this year. Uh, and then you also see a kind of uh, uh, in lawmaking, country uh, have uh, some country have in, introduced more restrictive uh, regulations on relating to foreign investment. If it's not direct, it's at least it's relevant. And then in this context, I would like to mention China introduced last year and this year two, uh, four very uh, important piece of law. One is the provision on unreliable entity list. Uh, and then the export control laws and the rules on counteracting 
and justified extraterritorial application of foreign legislation and measures. And of course, the most important now is the anti-foreign sanction law promulgated in June this year. So these laws, some provisions of the, in this law have direct application to foreign investment. Even those do not directly ref, uh, relate to foreign investment, they also have an impact. Because this bring, it can make a foreign investor and foreign investor the enterprise very nervous. Yeah, if one day they will be maybe listed as an unreliable entity. If you are mentioned in this list, then your business is ruined in China. Yeah, so if you are, if a foreign investor come from a country, that country impose section against China, then China may enact uh, China's, chi China's own anti-foreign section law. So, uh, measures can be used. So that could also be uh, putting a lot of uncertainty. So these new laws, regulations, really bring some uh, dark and gray uh, uh, color to the implementation of foreign investment law. Now let's uh, conclude quickly uh, by just give you a few simple uh, observations. First, if you look at the evolution of Chinese foreign investment regulatory uh, regime, it has been really uh, uh, reflect a, a policy change all the time. And China has always taken a top-down approach in making this law. And also the uh, merely 42 articles of 2019 FIL uh, uh, cover inadequately the complexity of the foreign investment regulatory regime. And then implementation regulations uh, were also made in a hurry in the end of 2019. So still a lot of uh, law uh, uh, refinement need uh, uh, further uh, uh, implementing regulations need to be done. Uh, another ob observation is that if you look at the 2019 FIL, actually the, it still reflects the basic nature of incentive and control approach. Uh, another observation we can make is that the international pressure, especially the US-China uh, trade war, uh, has really influenced here, has really influenced some major changes in the Chinese uh, foreign investment law. And the last point I would like to, to mention is the COVID-19 has made the implementation uh, of FIL delayed and more difficult. I think I will end up here with my uh, presentation. And uh, if you have time, I would like to uh, reply to any questions. Thank you, Yuan, for this very insightful uh, presentation, very detailed presentation of the highly complex legal framework surrounding FDI in China. And we have seen at work a uh, intertwined net of rules. And you gave us also a lot of element of context, uh, which uh, allow us to understand how is the law in action, in addition to the uh, uh, important aspects of law in the books. I would like to ask students if they have any question or any comment about this very interesting presentation. Vinicius. Yes, Vinicius, please. Um, thank you for the class. I didn't understand very well the difference between the catalog and the negative list. 
Can you explain it again? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the catalog had uh, was an old system, and the next list is a new one. So the catalog basically was a uh, part of the regime working with the uh, foreign the three uh, separate foreign investment law at that time. Uh, they used the catalog as as a, a extra uh, legal instrument to guide foreign investors. And negative list is a new system work with the new foreign investment law with the 2000 FIL. So now we don't in China, we don't mention the catalog anymore. It only nowadays only the negative list exists. But if you look at the contents, the negative list is a new version of the catalog, except the catalog list uh, for, for uh, prohibited and restricted um, much smaller now. May and we see you when that the negative list is in some way a simplification of the old catalog? Yeah. But yeah, but it's a very different approach. Right? In the catalog, you have uh, prohibited, restricted, and encouraged. But the in the active list, you only have prohibited and restricted. And much simple, yeah. Any other question? Okay, so if anybody uh, has not any question, um, we would like to thank Professor Li Yuan for her very uh, interesting lesson. And I also learned a lot. It was very useful um, um, for, uh, for us to follow uh, your lesson and to learn more about the latest development regarding FDI in China. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we keep in touch for our future uh, work together. And in the meanwhile, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It has been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Enjoy your study. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.